morning, church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Colby, and I'm one of the directors here at Zion. I'm so glad that you chose to be with us today in what has already been such a fantastic, spirit-filled morning. For those of you who haven't joined us yet this summer, we've been going through a series on spiritual warfare, and we're calling it, This is How I Fight. We've been talking about things like strongholds, which are the things that keep you stuck, and lies, and generational sins, and how you take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. We acknowledge that we have a very real enemy, but how your spouse, or your boss, or your mom or dad isn't that enemy. Our enemy is Satan. And Satan is the one who is responsible for wreaking havoc in your life. He is the one causing destruction and chaos and confusion and division. He hates you. And he hates me. He hates this church. He hates that we worship in the middle of the city and proclaim the name of Jesus. But we have one who's more powerful than him. We have a name that is more powerful than Satan. And that name is Jesus Christ. Satan hates God, period. And as people who are made in God's image, he hates us as well, and therefore, he is after us. And I'm sorry to have to start that morning out that way. It's not super, like, churchy or uplifting to say that. But even Satan's full blast hatred of you cannot even come close to separating you from the immense and powerful and never ceasing love that you have from God revealed through his son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, Satan has been defeated, and therefore his time to terrorize God's people is running out. So he's bringing his A game. He's studied his opponent. He has practiced well, and he is playing hard. Except for this isn't really a game, this is a battle. And that's why you and I, we have to learn how to fight. The war begins in our hearts, ate my hair there, but then it comes out of our mouth. It begins in our heart, but then it comes out of our mouth or out of someone else's mouth. There's only one war, but there are multiple battles. In fact, let me list out the battles that we're going to cover today. Battle number one is the battle of being dismissed. Battle number two is the battle of humiliation. Battle number three is the battle of false comfort. The fourth battle is the battle of people pleasing. Battle number five, the battle of comparison. Battle number six, the battle of accusation. And the last battle, the battle of rejection. All of these battles come out of our mouth, but first they go into our heart. I want to propose to you that the words spoken over you are the words that are spoken out of you. So my job today is to show you how harmful words are the work of your enemy and how you can fight and resist him. Okay, how many of you have heard the story of Jonah and the big fish? Okay, great. That has nothing to do with the message that we're going to cover today. Just needed to check in and make sure you're still with me. How many of you are familiar with David and Goliath? Yeah, no, no hands because people know how this is going. Okay, listen, we are going to talk on David and Goliath just a little bit, but it's not that battle that we're going to cover. Oh, I never know what to do here in this situation. Thank you, Justin. What about Saul? How many of you are familiar with Saul? And I don't mean Saul who becomes Paul. I mean Saul who becomes king. We have a few. (laughs) Pastor Jason says he's familiar with them, so that's good. Today we're going to go through the book of Samuel. It's an Old Testament book, so the events occur before Jesus' time on earth. 1 Samuel is actually uh, towards the front of the Bible, uh, maybe about a fifth, uh, a fifth of the way or so. Tell you what, it's right before 2 Samuel. So if you get to 2 Samuel, you've gone too far. And normally I would want you to open up God's word with me, uh, but our verses today are ranging from 1 Samuel chapter 10 to 1 Samuel chapter 24. So there is a lot of spiritual ground, scriptural ground to cover. So instead, I'm just going to tell the story to you. 
first, let me introduce to you a couple of characters uh, before we look at the specific text for today. There will be a lot of backstory throughout our day, so stick with me. I hope to do it justice. Before I introduce you to Saul, let me introduce you to Samuel. Uh, you might have guessed it. He's the namesake for the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel's a prophet of God, which means that his job is to turn God's people back to God, which then also means God's people have turned away from him. So Saul listens to God and then passes along specific information, uh, specific words, things like warnings or directions or commands, that specifically that God wants his people to hear. Samuel and all the other prophets are mouthpieces for the Lord. God speaks to the prophets, and then the prophets speak to the people, and so on and so on. This is basically just one big game of telephone. You would think that it would be a uh, fairly easy job to do. You're just passing messages back and forth. But no, God's people are naughty. And what we see in 1 Samuel is that they have continued to reject God, and now they are demanding that God give them an earthly king. They decide that it's not good enough for God to be in charge. They want someone in the flesh. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. That sounds like a terrible idea. God as king or human being as king? A perfect loving God as king or a flawed sinful human being as king? But God in his sovereignty allows for Israel to get an earthly king. Enter Saul. And I'm going to tell you up front, Saul's the antagonist of this story. He's the arch nemesis. But he doesn't actually start out as the bad guy. It's just, he gets hurt. In reality, things start out pretty good for Saul. Uh, scripture desc uh, describes him as tall and impressive, taller than anyone else, which in those days was an indication of good leadership skills, and more impressive than anybody else. But he doesn't let that get to his head. We see that Saul is humble. And God tells Samuel that Saul will be Israel's next king and that Saul will deliver his people from their enemy, the Philistines. Sadly, as we'll see, things change for, Sam for Saul. And, and he will go on to sin against the Lord, including but not limited to building his own, a monument only for himself. And therefore, he will lose the throne. Meet David. David's the incoming freshman king who will eventually replace Saul after Saul's disobedience. Scripture tells us that David's strong, uh, healthy, young, handsome, eloquent. He's a shepherd, a musician, and a warrior. Scripture, scripture says, and I quote, that he is a man after God's own heart. In case it isn't obvious, David has a lot going on for him. He's got hero status. And the cherry on top for David is that the Spirit of God comes powerfully upon him, and God is with him from that moment on. Here's what I'd like to suggest about, the, about spiritual battles through words. In all the battles that I listed out, the enemy takes the battle to one person, who then twists it, make it makes it their own, and then takes it to another person. In six of the seven battles we're going to cover today, we see that the words spoken over Saul become the words he speaks over David. In the seventh, it's David's brother, but it's the same story. The words spoken over us become the words spoken out of us. In each of these battles, I hope to list out what Saul did, that those are the tactics of the enemy and how David responded, and how those are our strategies to resist. To do this, like I said earlier, we're literally going to be all over the book of 1 Samuel. So remember, Samuel the prophet, Saul the king, David the incoming freshman king, with guest appearance by Goliath, David's brother Eliab, and Saul's son Jonathan. Are you ready? Saul's problems begin when he's anointed as king. Scripture tells us that the Spirit of God comes upon him and that God changes his heart. But what exactly did God change in Saul's heart? We don't know for sure. The text doesn't tell us. But here's what we can glean from it. Saul's got a past. 
yet he's willing to let God have access to his heart, and people take notice. He even begins to prophesy with the prophets, and the people can't believe it. Word starts getting around town, and everyone who knew him previously starts asking, is Saul also among the prophets? Now, let me translate these words for you. This is not, oh, wow, is this true? Saul's prophesying? Yay, congrats, Saul. This is, oh, my, how in the world can that man be used by God and be with those people? Is he really prophesying? How could a man like Saul be among the prophets? And here's what they're getting at. In their minds, Saul's past excludes him from being able to live in the current reality that God has for him. It is a battle of dismissiveness. The enemy makes you feel small, less than. He questions your past, makes you doubt that your sins are truly forgiven, makes you think that your past somehow prevents God from using you in the future, somehow prevents you from having anything good. The enemy questions your gifts. He makes you think things like, how could God really use someone like you? He makes you feel unworthy. He points out your limitations. Satan causes us to doubt where God wants us to be obedient. He causes us to doubt where God is calling us to go. Satan just totally dismisses anything of value of you. He dismisses you as being anything worthy of being utilized by God. Can't you just see Saul questioning whether or not God really chose him to be king, really chose him to have victory over the Philistines. The enemy is the ultimate. Did God really say? And he wants you to feel dismissed. Because if you feel dismissed, then that'll cause you to doubt, which and then will, will prevent you from pursuing the plan that God has for you. But here's the thing. The enemy didn't have to say a word. The people did it for him. And Saul speaks these feelings of dismissiveness and unworthiness and doubt over David later when David's about to go into battle with Goliath. Saul says, you can't fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. And he's been a warrior since he's young. Not exactly the best pep talk. Now, there are a lot of kids and and young adults in this park, and I want you to hear me say this. Your age, your, your young age, and your inexperience, or what looks like inexperience, does not negate the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. What is more powerful, a young David who has the Spirit of God with him or an entire army of those who do not? So listen, Gen Z's, and now we got Gen Alphas, you raise up and keep following the Lord. You keep relying upon him. You keep stepping out in faith. Our future is in your hands, and I am convinced they are good hands. I want you to hear David's response to Saul's doubt. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, that's when he was a shepherd, will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Listen, when you are in the battle of being dismissed, your strategy is to fight back, to remember where your strength comes from. You know it's not your strength. It's okay and even good to acknowledge your limitations because we remember that the Lord's limitless nature is on our side. So you go back to a time when you were victorious. You remember a place of assurance where God was with you, and you find new assurance in the current battle. You take up the shield of faith, remembering that the Lord has brought you victory in the past and that he is capable and willing to do it again. You take up that shield, and you let it cover you with confidence in what the Lord can do. And then you stand confidently, Trusting God, knowing that you've been here before, and you know how this battle ends. Our limitations, our weaknesses, our transformations, all reveal the glory of God. Unfortunately for Saul, the battle didn't end there. The people's statement of, is Saul also among the prophets? I don't know why I said it that way, it's kind of valley girlish. Is Saul really among the prophets? actually got repeated so many times that it became a popular saying. Uh, Raise your hand if you want your name to be associated with a a popular popular but otherwise negative saying. Yeah, no one, me neither. And so now, Saul's in the battle of humiliation. Saul's 
the butt of a running joke. How humiliating. But that's exactly how the enemy tries to advance. He knows you could get over something if it, if it was said just once. But why stop there? Let's get the people going. Let's get the gossip going. When something gets said about you over and over again, it's embarrassing. And what do you do when you're embarrassed? You cover your face. You hide, you skip town, you isolate. You don't want to be anywhere where you might hear that awful thing said again. And these are all tactics of the enemy. So now, while you're alone, and all the people who could speak, in, speak truth into you are nowhere to be found, you are helpless. And it's not that they can't be found because they left, it's that you left. Now, spoiler alert, Saul tries to kill David, like a lot of times, actually. It's uh, really kind of straight from a movie, in my opinion. But after one of these occurrences, David flees, a.k.a. hides, a.k.a. runs off. And he meets up with Saul's son, Jonathan, and asks him, what have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? David has been victimized. And let me say it this way, among other things, being victimized is humiliating. It's embarrassing. It really is. You question what's wrong with you that someone else would treat you that way. In fact, other people look at you and wonder, what's wrong with you? It's not fair, and it is a tactic of the enemy to bring you down. What did David do to make Saul want to kill him? I don't think he did anything. But Saul's humiliation twisted and became hatred, first as self-hatred, and then that self-hatred that he spoke over himself gets spoken over David. What's spoken over you, even if you're the one speaking it, gets spoken out of you. How does David respond to Saul's humiliation and murder attempts? What should our response be in the battle of humiliation? Okay, well, fast forward. We're now in a scene where David finds Saul in a cave, totally vulnerable, going to the bathroom. And I wonder, like, Lord, did we really need that much detail? But anyway, he's there, and it's the perfect time for David to take Saul out. And in fact, many people are encouraging that he do just that. But instead, David called to Saul, my Lord, my King, and when Saul looked behind him, David knelt low with his face to the ground and prayed homage. Now, okay, if someone is actually trying to kill you, I'm not advocating that you bow before them. That's dangerous, okay? But if someone is trying to kill you with their words, well, then respond like David. Our strategy in the battle of humiliation is, and this seems so counterintuitive, which is why the enemy never sees it coming, but our strategy in the battle of humiliation is humility. Humiliation says, I'll take you low. Humility says, I'll go low myself. I'll lower myself. The enemy will never see that coming because that's not in his character. That's not a tactic he's familiar with. Do you want to know where we do see this played out? In Jesus on the cross. Satan thought it would be so humiliating for Jesus to die a death like that, for Jesus to die on the cross. Yet he didn't see it coming that Jesus willingly humbled himself and put himself on that cross. So we humble ourselves before God. We consider one another, even our human enemies, better than us. We place them in a place of honor, a place higher than ourselves, because we know that we're already seated in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ. We already get that honor. And so we come, we, we wear the cleats of peace, cleats, not sandals, because we dig our feet in and declare that for the sake of peace, we'll bow our ego, we'll bow our agenda, we'll bow our will and our reputation so that God may be lifted high. So we have the battle of being dismissed, we have the battle of humiliation, and the next battle is the battle of false comfort. So here's how it goes for Saul. The Spirit of God leaves Saul, bad news, but worse news, an evil spirit from God is sent to torment him. Yes, you heard that right. 
So let's talk about it. An evil spirit from God, not of God, is sent by God to torment Saul. And listen, if we aren't careful, we might make some serious theological mistakes and assumptions about God here. So let me say it again. The evil spirit was from God, not of God. But why would the Lord send an evil spirit in the first place? Well, the most likely answer is that God used it as a way to discipline and correct Saul. There are consequences for sin. And I should also point out that evil spirits have free will and can make their own choices. That's how Satan rebelled in the beginning. But even with all of that, it does not mention that God approved of how the evil spirits tormented him. And I realize this is a difficult concept to understand, but let me simply say this. Sinfulness opens the door to spiritual attack. It just does. So Saul's not well. And one of his servants suggests they bring someone in who can play a little music to ease the pain. It'll make you feel better, they say. So a musician, good thought, except for that self-soothing, finding comfort outside of God and codependency are tactics of the enemy. Now, this is kind of a flashback scene because even though we've already met Saul and David today, in the story, uh, chronologically, this is the first time they've met. And David is the musician who came to play Saul's anxiety away. This is how they meet. But aside from David bringing Saul relief from the evil spirit, David also begins to be successful on the military front. And David's military success begins shining a good light on Saul. Uh, and so although Saul will go on to hate David and try to kill him, as of right now, Saul loves David. David makes Saul feel good, and David makes Saul look good. So good, in fact, that Saul now decides to keep David to himself and refuses to let him go home to his father or to tend his sheep. Saul's hooked, nay, codependent. On David. He needs David to save him. What did Satan do in this? He brought a very little attack of false comfort, allowing Saul to be temporarily comforted by someone other than the true source of comfort. He caused a diversion. He manipulated a situation so that it was easy for Saul to take his eyes off of God and fixate them somewhere else, namely on the person who was right in front of him, the, the person who he thought could save him. So what's our strategy against this kind of attack? Let me read to you that something that David says to Goliath before they battled. He said, Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. Why do we seek comfort? Well, I think it's primarily because we're trying to soothe a wound or a worry or a fear. I think it could be that even if for just a moment we've forgotten whose battle it really is. We've forgotten how the Lord saves. Maybe we even forgot that the Lord does save. For a moment, we have taken off the helmet of salvation. So you battle by putting that helmet back on. Fasten it. Secure it. It is the piece of armor that is protecting your mind. It is the piece that is reminding you that Jesus is the true source of salvation, that Jesus is the true source of comfort, and that Jesus is the true source of defense. Be comforted then by the fact that your salvation is secured in Christ Jesus, and it cannot be lost. And that hope, that comfort, is enough to soothe, no, not just soothe, heal any word, ease any worry, and overcome any fear. The next battle I want to talk about is the specific battle of people-pleasing or the fear of man. They really are two sides of the same coin. If you want people to approve of you, ultimately you'll fear what will happen if you don't. If you fear man, then you're always looking to please them so you don't make them mad. And we see in Saul this battle occur pretty early on in his reign. 
like on his coronation day. Now, I find this to be rather ironic, given the fact that the people rejected God as king and demanded an earthly king, yet when Saul was chosen, they said, yeah, but not that one. And we'll discuss this rejection a little later on, but at the moment, I want to talk to you about the ones who liked Saul. And actually, they loved Saul. Saul had a fan base. And you know what? It's fun to please people. We like to make people happy, fill their buckets. We like it when people like us. And so like for Saul, when you've tasted the polar opposites of some people hating you and other people loving you, you much prefer that they love you. You'll do anything to get that kind of favor. But Saul's fear of man, his seeking of man's approval, his people-pleasing tendencies ends up leading him down a very destructive path. And he gets busted doing something he knows he shouldn't be doing. He sacrifices to God when he shouldn't be sacrificing. And Samuel confronts him, calls him out on his sin. But here's Saul's excuse. Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Saul openly admitted that he did what he did because the people wanted him to do it. Because he was afraid of them. Uh, you know that long ghost fake eek emoji? Like, I wish I could insert that right here. Because of Saul's disobedience, God decides to take the crown from Saul and give it to someone else. He lost his throne because the real enemy, Satan, persuaded him to disobey, rebel, and be defiant towards God. Satan used the tactic of feeding Saul's ego, making him feel good that people liked him. But Saul lost the throne because of it. He wanted their praise. He liked being liked. And this led him to sin against God. And honestly, people are scary. They're powerful. They can break or break you. They can bring you in or push you out. They can elevate you or they can cancel you. And Saul's no dummy. He knows this. And he points his people-pleasing tendencies onto David. When Saul realizes later on that his son Jonathan and him, are be that him and David are best friends and that Saul's daughter Michael loves Saul, loves David, Saul gets worried. He becomes afraid of David. And scripture goes on to tell us that as a result, Saul was David's enemy from that day forward. The battle for the approval of man or the battle for the fear of man does not lead to kind, loving, or fulfilling relationships. It leads to hate-filled, destroyed, enemy kind of ones. And so how do we resist the battle of people-pleasing? I see some examples through David when he had the opportunity to take Saul out in the cave. He told him, I haven't sinned against you. I haven't rebelled. I haven't committed a crime. And here's the thing, ultimately, those decisions please God. We fight the devil's schemes of, peop uh, of people pleasing by rejecting the idea that people are the source of approval and by leaning into the approval of God through Christ Jesus. We live a life that honors and pleases God, a life filled with obedience, submission, innocence, and confession. We remember that people are scary, but that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. We remember that people are powerful, but they don't even come close to a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-capable. We put on the breastplate of righteousness so that Christ's righteousness covers our hearts. We don that breastplate proudly knowing that when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus. And in Jesus, all the things he sees pleases him. We put on that breastplate of righteous, and then we live out of God's approval for us. We live out of an approval that we already have instead of for an approval we'll never get. We speak Jesus' approval over us so that it gets spoken out of us in the way we live. And it's not just that Saul is in the battle of people-pleasing. It's also that he's in the battle of comparison. So here he is trying to get people to like him while simultaneously being uh, compared to other people, actually one person in particular, who is better than him, David. 
And, Saul, and after Saul sins and things went south for him regarding being king, Samuel tells him that someone, a neighbor, who is better than him will get the throne. I don't know about you, but the idea that your successor will be better than you and will do better than you is not fun. And that might be on Saul's mind when David returns to town after defeating and killing Goliath. The armies are on their way back to the Israelite cities, and the women are out dancing, singing, and celebrating. They're having a good old time. And scripture says, as they danced, the woman sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul was furious and resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credit me with thousands? What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. Okay, let me start to break things down. The celebration gets sour for Saul when people start comparing Saul's military accomplishments with David's. And they're celebrating David's. Now remember, Samuel has already prophesied to Saul that he would be dethroned and that it was his neighbor who would be better, to him, better than him that would rule. A statement like this stays with you. And so when the women start singing, I mean, that had to be so annoying for Saul that David was better than him. It set him off. I hope you see how Saul responds to this battle, that how, how Saul responds are the tactics of the enemy against us. Let me reread Saul's response to you. Saul gets angry, furious, actually. He starts having a pity party, wondering why his accomplishments aren't being celebrated. He complains. He starts feeling threatened that David will get the kingdom. He becomes paranoid, which causes him to, like, start stalking David, and he becomes jealous. Comparison is a tool of the enemy, and Saul is trapped. Saul's throne was threatened, and so he becomes obsessed with David and it turns to jealousy. Andy, Andy Stanley in his book, Enemies of the Heart, suggests that jealousy ultimately comes down to this thought, God owes me. So it wasn't just that David was mad at, uh, that Saul was mad at David, he was mad at God. God could have given him the best. He could have made him the best, but God held out. And so now it's, so much, it's, it's not so much that Saul wants what David has, it's that he wants what God could have but didn't give him. In jealousy, Saul says, I deserve the praises of my people. Instead, God is giving it to David. I deserve the kingdom, but God is taking it from me. God doesn't make things happen for me, but things are working out for David. In essence, God owes me. And yet David, when he encounters Saul in that cave, has the exact opposite response. He doesn't think God owes him anything, and actually he doesn't even engage in the battle of comparison with Saul. David says, may the Lord judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. I love David's strategies for resisting the enemy here. David acknowledges the truth of who God is and what God can do. He acknowledges the truth that the Lord is the true judge, which should stop any basis for comparison all by himself. David acknowledges the truth that God defends him and delivers him. David remembers God's character. And that's exactly what you and I should do when we get hit with the battle of comparison. Put on the belt of truth. Truth, Christ's truth, stabilizes and secures the rest of your spiritual armor. It helps you remember who God is, and when you do that, you can overcome self-pity with gratitude, anger with forgiveness, and jealousy with generosity. When we acknowledge the truth that Jesus doesn't owe us anything, that actually he gave us all, we defeat the enemy's schemes. I'm going to skip ahead. <clears throat> For a time's sake, I've never once in my life watched the time, but here I see that we're running over. So, I have to do this one, though. Are you ready? We've come to the last battle. It's the battle of rejection. Basically, uh, what happens is that this one goes after the heart of God. Saul has an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and then he's anointed as king. Scripture says, some wicked, wicked men said, how can, this God, how can this guy save us? And they despised him and did not bring him a gift, but Saul said nothing. Here's what this battle is after. The battle of rejection 
is the enemy's most dangerous tactic. He will make you feel unloved and unlovable. There are no depths that a man or a woman won't go to have, be, or experience love, or to ease the pain of not being loved. I really don't know how to explain why Saul decided to do what he did next, but he did attempt to kill David. I can only assume that somewhere inside of him there was a deep lack of love or an abundance of hatred. We see two important things happening here. One of Saul's murderous ideas was to send David back into the military and have, the ba uh, have him be killed in the battle. And then for those of you who have any familiarity with David, you know that that's exactly what he does later on to Bathsheba's wife, the woman that he wants, uh, Bathsheba's husband, the woman that he wants. Unless God intervenes in us, what comes into our life goes out of our life. Secondly, nope, skipping that. We resist the, uh, the devil by believing and declaring God's love over our lives. We remember that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We remind ourselves that God chose us, that he didn't just accept us. He chose us and that we share an, internal, an eternal inheritance with him. We resist the battle of rejection by telling other people that same good news that Jesus loves them and that they are no longer rejected themselves. The way we battle words and feeling of rejection is to know that out of that great love, out of God's great love for you, you are chosen, redeemed, and made new. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the, sp the sword of the Spirit is actually more like a dagger than a sword. Its primary use is for battles that are up close and in your face. I learned something really cool when I was doing my studies. The Bible says that the word of God... Uh, the, I'm sorry, the sword of the spirit is the word of God, which I always thought to mean the Bible. The Greek word for the written word is logos. So when we refer to the Bible, we refer to logos, which is the written word. But the sword of the spirit, the word of, the, of God there is rhema. The Greek word is rhema. And that means, uh, uh, sorry, rhema is an utterance of God. It's the way the written word, it's the way Logos comes alive and speaks personally to you. It's like when the pastor says something that you think is just for you, or when a friend says the exact thing you need to hear, or when a worship song brings new meaning to scripture, that's rhema, that's the sword of the spirit. So when you are in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, when you're face-to-face -face with your enemy, when you're close to the ground and about to go down, you deploy the sword of the spirit. It is your only offensive weapon you pull out that dagger God's word specifically to you and for you his personal words of love for you and you take your enemy out I, I want to invite the band up as we close listen friend you are in a battle you might be in multiple battles right now. You might be in a battle of dismissiveness, of being told or feeling that you're less than. You might be feeling humiliated. You might be trying to comfort yourself in all the wrong places except for Jesus. You might be battling your people-pleasing issue. You could be caught in the trap of comparison. There might be accusations flying all around you. You might be in the battle of your life to remember that you are loved and not rejected. You are in a battle, but you are not alone. And although you've already been, you already are victor victorious in Jesus Christ, if you are not careful, the words spoken over you become the words spoken out of you. So it's a good thing then that the cross has the final say. Jesus' death and resurrection speak over you. I want to read to you and declare over you 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And then we're going to pray. But you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, God's special possession. So that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. God, I just know and believe that there are so many words that have been spoken over this crowd that have hurt them and caused deep wounds. And I know, God, 
I know because I see it in the, in the story of Saul and David, and I know because I see it in my story that the words spoken over me come out of me. So God, I'm asking you to reveal those words. I'm asking you that we would be courageous to reject those words, to confess those words, to bring those to the light. God, we know that you have already chosen us, that you love us, that you will use every ounce we give you for your glory. And God, that is why we are here. We are here to lift your name high. We are here so that the world knows you. We're here so that they know that you have a son who went to the cross for us. God, you are so good. Thank you that the cross has the final say. Thank you that no matter what and what the enemy tries to come against me with words, you have already spoken something louder and truer and better. Father God, I pray that today your good words, the words that you speak over your people, God, I pray today that those would be the words that they speak over their lives, that they would receive your words. And Father, I pray then that they would go live out of that. Lord, we love you. Father, um, I'm asking that if anybody had a specific word of something that they said or that someone said to them, that during worship they would speak that out loud. You promise that you'll reveal things to the light. You've called us out of darkness. We were once in darkness, but now we're no longer there. We are seated with you in the heavenly realms, and we praise you for that. God, move in us today. In Jesus' name, amen.